for now a full two months into the 115th Congress. How well have Republicans done with their unified control of both houses plus the presidency, the entire government? Well, so far, they passed no major legislation, haven't held a hearing for Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch, and still have not confirmed four of the president's cabinet picks. More meaningfully, perhaps, they also haven't confirmed dozens of political appointees you have never heard of, but who are critical for running the government. The Senate's been in session for 57 days so far. They've already taken 22 days off. They'll have a massive two-week break in April, too. What exactly is going on up there? Senator John Cornyn is the Senate Majority Whip. As Whip, his job is to win Senate votes by keeping Republican senators in line. Senator Cornyn of Texas joins us now. Senator, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Tucker. Um, so we checked uh, the record of the Obama administration in its first couple of months in office uh, in early 2009 against the record here. Now, Obama had a Democratic uh, Congress, as you know. So by March 1st, eight years ago, the Congress had passed and the president had signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. They'd renewed S-CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program. They'd signed a $831 billion stimulus bill. And of course, the Congress had approved the president's plan for withdrawing from Iraq. They've done an awful lot. This Congress, Republican Congress, doesn't seem to have done much at all. Why hasn't anything been done so far, exactly? Well, the main reason is because Democrats have been dragging their feet on nominations and uh, burning up time. For example, Ryan Zinke was approved by a substantial supermajority today, Wilbur Ross by, I think, 72 votes last night. Right. There's no reason to, de to deny the president his cabinet other than just to burn up time and make it impossible for us to turn to other legislation. So it's uh, enormously frustrating, but this is the way uh, the, way the system, uh, unfortunately, operates when people are determined to, to drag their heels. So why so much time off then? Why does the Senate take so much time off? Forty percent of the days since this Congress convened, the Senate has not been working. In April, according to the Senate calendar, you guys are only working for 10 days the entire month. If it's taking more time than expected, then why not work more? Well, we didn't get a president until January the 20th, and that's about uh, five weeks ago, roughly. And uh, yes, uh, we, we were in session for most of that time. We did take a week to return home. I took a number of my colleagues to the border, thinking it was important with all the attention given to border security and trade and, and taxes and the like to take some of my colleagues from North Carolina and Nevada to learn more about the important relationship, economic relationship we have with Mexico because of bilateral trade. Trade. And those are the kinds of things you do when we're not in session. So it's, uh, right. it's, I dare say, it's not taking time off. Well, and I, you know, I don't think you all are lazy. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that. I just mean that there's a new, there's a new government elected in November, and they can't govern because they can't get their people appointed. As you know, I mean, I've, I've spoken to people at the cabinet level who say, my guys aren't going to get confirmed until the middle of the summer, till July. I mean, that's kind of a crisis. So why not forestall the trip to Mexico and just get the government installed? Wouldn't that be a better course? Well, there is a problem in that uh, many of the sub-cabinet nominees have not yet been nominated, and so there is nothing for the Senate to operate on. I'm hopeful that the White House will accelerate the uh, nomination process and get them to us so we can take them up and confirm them. But uh, you're right. It's enormously frustrating to all of us, but it's a combination of both obstruction on the Democratic side and, the, uh, at least so far, the administration not getting these sub-cabinet appointees to us for confirmation. But, I mean, you all could just drop the hammer on the Democrats and do it, couldn't you? Well, um, we can't make the White House nominate sub-cabinet nominees. We, could, we can grind through the uh, cabinet-level nominees, and we literally have been doing it. Under the Senate rules, we can get to about three a week when they are obstructing as they are now. And again, this is part of their um, relitigation, I guess, uh, of the, their loss on November the 8th. They simply have not gotten beyond the uh, denial and now anger. Uh, sooner or later, I think they're going to have to reconcile themselves to the fact that they lost to the election but, and then try to try to be productive. Well, I mean, I'm no you know, Ph.D. in Senate order, but don't I mean, you could force this stuff. You could just do it. You have the votes, don't you? Don't Republicans have the votes to do whatever they want, essentially, short of a Supreme Court nomination? Well, on confirmations, you're right, it takes 51 votes now instead of the 60, thanks right. to Harry Reid. But there, it did not affect the process by which it takes us aggravatingly long time in order to confirm nominees. So the most we've been able to do, given Democratic obstruction, is three a week. And that's 
one reason for the slow pace. It's just so, no excuse for it, but that's unfortunately the process. So, I mean, it does seem from an outsider's perspective like maybe there's a, an ideological component here. I know that a lot of Republicans in Washington don't agree with some of the president's priorities. And if you look at the bills, and we took a, a check of this, that are languishing in committee, I just wonder if any of these will ever get out. So Kate's law, the famous Kate Steinle law that would set mandatory minimums um, for illegal immigrants reentering the country is sitting in a committee. The bill that would revoke uh, any chance of becoming a citizen for U.S. nationals engaged in terrorism. I mean, you could kind of go down the list. A, a bill that would prevent refugees from being settled in states if the governor opposes it. Do Republicans in leadership support those efforts, do you think? Well, I think by and large we we are supportive of the administration's positions, but the bills that you mentioned, uh, of course, died at the end of the Obama administration. Right. Had to be refiled, and so they have to go through the committee process. Part of why the Judiciary Committee is um, is delayed now is because we're working and anticipating the confirmation of Judge Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. Other committees are working primarily on the Obamacare repeal and replace, which will take place in the coming few weeks. That's been our focus along with tax reform, which we plan to do shortly after that. So I share with you your frustration about the slow pace. Unfortunately, a lot of that's built into the process, but right. we're determined to get, uh, get some important things done. So, I mean, reassure Republicans who voted for Trump that none of this is being slow walked. I know a lot of people who work on Capitol Hill who are Republicans who did not vote for Donald Trump. They voted for Hillary Clinton. Some of them are in your office, by the way. Are you sure that your <laughs> staff, it's true, are you sure that your staff and the staff of other leaders on the Republican side in the Senate and the House are really supportive of this agenda? We are fully supportive of President Trump and his agenda, and we're trying to do our best to help him. Uh, he's due to governing, and we all understand that. Well, that's one reason he got elected, because people thought he would bring uh, change to the way Washington operates, and he already has. So we fully support the president's agenda, and we're working with him. Had lunch over at the White House today with a number, the speaker, the majority leader of uh, both houses, uh, trying to figure out how to advance the president's agenda and get it accomplished. And we are on that path as I speak. Well, part of his agenda is building a wall. He campaigned on it. Your state voted for him in part because of that. And then you were quoted the other day saying you're not for a wall and the people of Texas are not for a wall. What gives you that impression, Consider, I think you won your state nine points, something like that pretty definitive win running on the wall. Why would you well, think your voters would not be for that? Well, I'm, the Texas uh, border, and one reason I took my colleagues to Texas was to show them this 1,200-mile border, some of which has 3,500-foot cliffs in the Big Bend area where no wall is really necessary. There are other areas where infrastructure is important, barriers, if you say, uh, so to speak, but it's really a combination of personnel, technology, and infrastructure. We're working right now with the uh, Department of Homeland Security to come up with a plan to actually implement the president's goal of securing the border. It's long overdue, and I fully support that. We intend to try to make that happen. But, but he said, I'm run, I mean, not to be a stickler for, on semantics, but he said, I'm, I want a wall. I want a big, beautiful wall. I mean, that was from the first day of his campaign until last. I want a wall. So why would you think that voters in your state, exempting like the cliffs, but for the rest of the border, why wouldn't they want a wall too? Didn't they vote for that? I don't think they, I, I think they voted for border security. How we accomplish that, I think they expect us to use our best judgment to try to accomplish. It's really just a matter of political will. We know how to do it. It's the, the problem has been we haven't had a president who actually believed in border security. We do now. And we're fully trying to support and implement that effort together with interior enforcement, which represents people who come in and overstay, represent 40% of illegal immigration. And we don't do nearly enough to discourage that. Right. So, no, for so sure. So you think so your voters, with the president. when they voted for Trump, they, they didn't, weren't voting for the wall he promised. They're voting for Republican senators to figure out how to secure the border. But they, they didn't really mean a wall when they voted for a guy who promised a wall. They expect us to use our best judgment and our experience to accomplish that goal, I think. And a wall, I have to tell you, Tucker, um, is not going to stop illegal immigration if you don't have the personnel on the ground to catch them, if you don't have the technology, the eyes in the sky in order to detect them so Border Patrol can actually get there in time. There are places where a physical barrier is entirely appropriate, and we ought to be putting them there, but we ought to come up with the right combination that allows us to accomplish the goal efficiently and effectively without wasting taxpayer dollar. That's been my goal. Okay.
Senator Corden, thanks for joining us. I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Dr.